launched it, one of the cornerstone pillars that we had was we have to talk about hardware right away and get hardware people excited to put this in silicon because it's, yeah, for the device needs, you have to have it. Not for performance, I, my opinion, not so much for performance as for battery. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of the old formats kind of rely on like old television formats mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, what are the, the challenges of switching to the more web-oriented formats and, and such? Um, uh, like what benefits? Well, one of the challenges is just people's ideas about, like when we were designing the page before Google acquired us, we actually was, might even be seven. Well, then on to it, this enormous fight over whether we should support internet which has no purpose. That means progressive skill. There is no way. Television, it's an interlaced form to you know, interlaced fields. There's no use for it. You know, it's a huge fight. So what is, that, that's part of it is like everybody is so freaked out about taking anything out. Like, well, yeah, but I can see where, it, well, it doesn't matter. Even if you can see a, a, a corner case for it, it's much better for the whole experience, the whole technology. Just get stuff like that out. You don't need it. Something like uh, like move movie atoms, you know, QuickTime files. Like if you want to, uh, for a streaming file, it's a big chunk of garbage at the front of the file that you have to load it, and parse through it. It's just this. There's, there's doesn't need to be that complicated for web video. So the goals for that for web video are. It should be very fast, obviously. It should, um, the networks that it operates on, which are kind of a mess, but it's what we have, they should be able to adapt to the network conditions immediately. It should have all this. I mean, I even remember when, um, you know, people claimed, when, back early in on to early 2000, people were saying, you know, video over HTTP will never work. It, you should, everything should be like RTP and RTSP and all these crazy, complicated, you know, stateful programs. It's like, that's insane. <laughs> of course it'll work. Uh, and now we're, you know, we're doing things in our project. We're, divide, we're designing um, an HTTP adaptive streaming. You know, a lot of the ones out there have patent encumbrances and royalties. So most of it is just, you know, because in one of the, this is one of the virtues of Google is they understand the internet pretty well, and kind of what they do, you know. And they're trying to get other things, and you can see it. I mean, perfectly frank about talking about it. Like things like Google TV, it's like, yeah, you know, we're figuring it out. But it's, so the philosophy is you release something and you iterate to make it better. The internet, I mean, they just they understand it. They understand protocols and all this stuff. So we not only have all the video guys to draw on, but we also have everybody at Google understands things. We don't understand about how HTTP really, really works. You know, just the way it's spec and the way it actually works sometimes are two different things. Or the way it's implemented. So it's things like that. Does that answer your question? I might have yeah. a bit of a long-winded answer, but I would say more, more than anything, it's just getting people to give up their old preconceived notions of okay, first we're gonna take everything we already have and dump it in this bucket, and then we're gonna sift through the bucket and pick out the we're starting from base you know, level set. That's what we're uh, I have a question about how you said there's a, that experimental branch in your repo. So, like, how do you decide what makes it from experimental to like actually becoming involved in the program? Um, well, the, ne the next codec is. I mean, right now we're kind of gathering the requirements for it, but I don't. That, that's kind of my job, is to sort of, but I don't want that to interfere with what goes on in the experimental branch. So we kind of, the experimental branch, it, if you, you know, if you check something in, it'll get reviewed, and then committed, and then it might come out later. This is the thing where we're going to have to make a lot of decisions, and that's why we want to do it in public. We don't want it to be, because the way a lot of the MPEG code, well, well all the MPEG code is defined is there's a committee of people go to meetings in exotic cities all over the world. And they, it's a very it's a secret. It's a closed group. They get together. And then when they're done with that, they publish it. They publish the spec. People can comment on it. But we want to just put, you know, get everybody's ideas in there. 
I mean, if, yeah, if something comes in and it's just nonsense, we won't check it in. But if something comes in, it's interesting, we'll add it. And then when it comes time to make those decisions, we'll do with the community. What comes out of that will be um, quasi standardized, I guess you'd say, because it's kind of like, I don't know if you, nobody understands how all these standards groups work, but um, most of them are done through, you know, you rep have a representation of like a country. So, the United States has a contingent that goes to the NPEG meetings, or France. And, uh, there's another group called the ITF, which is basically has built the internet, and in all the standards, mostly protocol things were designed or defined by the ITF. The ITF is an individual membership committee or group, whatever you want to call it. It's, a, it's individuals. So even though you have people there from Google and Cisco, they're not there representing Apple, Cisco, but they're there as, you know, Jill Smith, or whatever. That, that's their contributions as an individual. And that's also the way we think that it should be done. So anybody who wants to come and chip in and give their opinion or contribute anything, the only way we ask is that, well, the only way we demand is that you're not going to get involved. So is the 3D video in, in Horizon or where is it? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's been on the horizon for 20 years. You know, it's kind of one of these things where it's, it's I, you know, I mean, I dig it. I, I saw Avatar. It was great, whatever. But, you know, for web video, it's, you know, you go, you go to a lot of trade shows, and there's always a guy with glasses. He's like, here, put on these glasses. And, put, and we did a project with Firefox and NVIDIA to do, it's just side by side. It's not. Yeah, I mean, there'll be a market for it, but but there but people out there who are like, that's it. Everything's going to be 3D. I mean, you're going to watch the evening news in 3D. It's, no, that's not going to happen. It's, a very, it's, it's good for specific things, but it, you, know, you don't have to paint everything with 3D. So we're, it's something that um, today, because of the way Matroska is designed, we do, for various reasons, we do side by side. But for VP9, we're definitely looking at better ways to do 3D. But yeah, unless you're in a really immersive experience, like a big movie theater, or, even with the glasses, it's sort of freaky, you know, because you're, you're not there experiencing the whole thing. It's like, oh, you know, it's, but that's that's my opinion. And there are people I work with who are of the opposite. You know, like you're crazy. Everything's going to be 3D because you know, it comes down to the market. Uh, that. Uh, you also mentioned some of uh, the uh, limitations of mobile platforms. Yeah. Are there any specific codecs being developed for maybe lightweight, uh, more lightweight, or more optimized for mobile devices? Uh, that was the goal of baseline, 264, well, one. Um, for video, yeah, I mean, you have a lot of proprietary companies. Uh, Videos. I mean, a lot of them are variations on 264, but um, VP8, that was one, of, when we designed it, that was one of the requirements was that it not be, that we, no matter what we did, we were going to keep the decoding complexity low for that very reason. Because we knew, because we were a small company that we were owned by Google, and we said we're never going to convince people to put this in hardware until it's deployed in software, and then that gives chip people an incentive to do it. Um, in the audio world, there's an interesting project at the ITF called Opus, which is a um, this the WebRTC thing I mentioned, the real-time communication of the browser group. What this is the, the, the Ziff guys, the guys that do more this. Uh, what they've done is they take, they've taken a wide band audio codec and an area band code, audio codec and mushed them together. So Opus is um, narrow band codec that Ziff developed called Kelt and Skype's Silk in one it's, it's crazy. It's, it's very interesting if you want to read something interesting in the draft spec for that the ITF is pretty cool. So things like that, you know, that's a definitely requirement of theirs is yeah, for mobile narrow band stuff, very specific things. Uh, um, error resiliency is a huge problem. A lot of these networks are so the packet doesn't show up. 
<laughs> what do I do now? Well, you know, a lot of that stuff has to be designed into the code itself. VPA has um, not only the error resiliency, but the error concealment is something we added recently, which is pretty cool. We haven't had a side by side video showing the one without error concealment, and the one without is all blatchy and nasty, and the one with it. It's not perfect, but it just looks enormous. So there's things like that, and, and mobile. I mean, that's going to be huge forever for the future. It's kind of where. Let me thank uh, John. Speakers, they give them T-shirt. This is bringing coal to Newcastle. We can. Be, we are giving T-shirt to Google people. That's. that's I brought it. you T-shirts so, too. So, yeah. So they exchange T-shirts. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Cool. So this is the traditional. Um, I only had extra larges, but you all look like pretty strong strappers. <laughs> uh, and I also brought stickers. So I know I. You know you can never show up without. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah.